The first security goal of cryptography that we have a closer look at is confidentiality, which is the security goal demanding that information is only accessible to authorized parties. The primary cryptographic concept serving the security goal is encryption, and the first major approach to encryption is symmetric encryption. The characteristic property of a symmetric encryption system is that a single key K is used for both the encryption operation as well as the decryption operation. What you can see here on the left side of the slide is a flowchart describing how a symmetric encryption system works. If a plain text should be kept confidential, then within a symmetric encryption system, a symmetric key K needs to be taken with which the plain text can be encrypted by an encryption process resulting in a ciphertext. To anyone without any knowledge about the symmetric key used, this ciphertext then looks like a random piece of data without any relationship to the original plaintext. However, the very same symmetric key K that was used to encrypt the plaintext into the ciphertext can be taken to decrypt the ciphertext back into the original plaintext. In practice, the encryption and decryption process are very often the advanced encryption standard AES, which was released by NIST back in the year 2001 and so far has withstood all attempts to break it, at least as far as the publicly available knowledge on this subject reaches. With AES, the symmetric keys used can be of length 128 bits, 192 bits or 256 bits and as AES is a block cipher in and by itself only encrypting 128-bit blocks, AES needs to operate behind a block cipher mode of operation in order to make it practically usable and to allow for an unlimited amount of data to be encrypted. A historically very popular block cipher mode of operation is CBC, the cipher block chaining mode of operation, which is secure, but notoriously difficult to implement and use correctly. By now, a block cipher mode of operation gaining rapidly in popularity is GCM, the Galois counter mode of operation, which is actually an instance of authenticated encryption with associated data, AEAD, and as such managed to simultaneously provide confidentiality and authenticity to data. Looking again at the flowchart on the left side, it's clear that in order for a pair of a sender and a receiver, let's call them Alice and Bob, that in order for Alice and Bob to use symmetric encryption to encrypt data between them, both Alice and Bob need to be in possession of the same symmetric key K. If you consider a system with multiple participants, then using symmetric encryption would actually require each pair within the group of participants to have a dedicated symmetric key, which unfortunately is a number of keys quadratic to the number of participants in the system, which is a number that very soon is infeasible for systems to provide. And as such, symmetric encryption systems are out of the box, not systems that scale well with respect to the number of participants. Asymmetric encryption as the key property and main difference to symmetric encryption now makes use of a pair of keys made up of a public encryption key and a corresponding private decryption key. Looking at the flowchart on the left, describing how an asymmetric encryption system works, it's clear that in order to encrypt a plain text into a ciphertext, one needs to get hold of the public encryption key of an asymmetric public-private key pair. The resulting ciphertext then again looks like a random piece of data to anyone without any knowledge about this time the private decryption key corresponding to the public key used for the encryption. However, if in possession of the private decryption key 
associated with the public key that was used for the encryption, then this private decryption key can be used to decrypt the ciphertext back into the original plain text. In practice, a classic and fundamental asymmetric encryption scheme is RSA. With RSA, the public private keys involved are nowadays recommended to be of size at least 2048 bits, and as of the year 2030, to be of size at least 3072 bits. Importantly, with Shor's algorithm, a fast algorithm exists for quantum computers to break RSA. As such, we need to be aware that RSA will likely one day have to be replaced by an appropriate post-quantum cryptography algorithm resistant to the exponential speedup of quantum computers when compared with classic computers. On the previous slide, I pointed out that symmetric encryption schemes don't scale well with the number of participants in a system. This is now not the case with asymmetric encryption schemes, as with asymmetric encryption schemes, such as for example RSA, the only requirement is that each participant owns a public-private key pair, where the public key can then be used by peers that want to confidentially send data to the participant and owner of the key pair. As such, we can conclude that asymmetric encryption schemes scale well in terms of number of participants in a system, as only a linear number of keys is required, and not a quadratic number of keys, as it was the case with symmetric encryption schemes. As great as this is, the downside to asymmetric encryption schemes is that by using just the asymmetric encryption itself, the size of the data that can be encrypted with it is very small. In fact, if RSA is used, the size of the data that can be encrypted with RSA is just about the size of the keys involved. So if RSA keys of length 2048 bits are used, the data can be at most just about 2048 bits as well, which is obviously not practically usable. But how about in order to solve this new limitation, to try to combine symmetric encryption with asymmetric encryption into a hybrid encryption scheme? As a short recap, we got to see that symmetric encryption systems can encrypt arbitrarily large data at the cost of a large quadratic number of keys required, and we got to see how asymmetric encryption systems solve this limitation by just requiring one key for each participant. However, at the cost of now only being capable of encrypting a very small plaintext, which is practically not usable. The best of both worlds can now be combined into a hybrid encryption scheme where the prerequisite is simply that each participant, and let's again just call her Alice, is required to own a public-private key pair, for example, an RSA key pair. If Alice has such a public-private RSA key pair and has made the public encryption key publicly available, then Bob, who wants to confidentially send Alice a plain text, proceeds as follows. In a first step, Bob creates a completely new random symmetric AES key K of an appropriate length, for example, 128 bits. Bob then uses this new random AES key K to encrypt his plain text, which results in a ciphertext. Bob then takes the public encryption key of Alice and with the public encryption key of Alice, encrypts the new and randomly generated AES key with RSA, which results in an encrypted key K. Bob then sends both the ciphertext together with the encrypted key K to Alice, who then, in a first step, takes her private RSA decryption key and decrypts the received encrypted key K back into the symmetric AES key K that Bob freshly generated just recently. Having recovered the symmetric AES key K, Alice can then proceed 
to recover the original plain text by simply using this AES key to decrypt the received ciphertext with AES back into the plain text Bob originally sent. This hypercryption approach now really combines the best of the two worlds insofar as that only one key pair per participant is required to begin with. Furthermore, the bulk of the data, which is the plain text that can be of arbitrary size, is encrypted with AES, which RSA by itself would not be capable or at most be capable at a very significant loss of performance. This is great, but nevertheless, this hybrid encryption approach has one major drawback. The main problem with a hybrid encryption approach like this is that in such a hybrid encryption scheme, the security completely relies on the secrecy of the private decryption key of the participant. Although short lifetimes are recommended nowadays, such public private key pairs often have a lifetime of multiple years and over the course of their lifetime are repeatedly used to encrypt the symmetric keys used for the encryption of the ought to be confidential data. The longer the lifetime of such a public private key pair, the more symmetric keys are encrypted with it. And once a private key would leak, all the data exchanged under this private key can be recovered. Of course, this requires an adversary to keep a record of all the encrypted data received by a participant with the hope that one day the private key of the participant either is leaked or that algorithms emerge that can calculate private keys from the corresponding public keys. With Shor's algorithm, such a fast algorithm that can break RSA actually exists already. Of course, Shor's algorithm is an algorithm for quantum computers, so in order for it to be effective, quantum computers of sufficient size first need to be built. Now, all of this may sound a bit far-stretched, but it's commonly assumed that large nation-state actors maintain large archives of encrypted internet communication taking place relative to certain participants, with the hope to one day possibly being able to decrypt this recorded data. This problem can be solved by using ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, which make sure that the symmetric key K is never on the wire between Alice and Bob, neither in plain nor encrypted. Ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchanges are amazing and how they really work, I will explain in the next lesson. Stay tuned.